Hi, my name is Monty Johnson. I teach philosophy at the University of California, San Diego. And this is the first of two lectures on Aristotle's politics, book five, the first nine chapters on the causes and motives of constitutional change and constitutional preservation. So here's an overall outline of book five. The first four chapters are about the general causes of constitutional change and what Aristotle calls stasis, meaning civil war, faction, or revolution. Chapters five to seven then are about the specific causes of constitutional change and stasis in democracies, in oligarchies, and in polities and aristocracies. Chapters eight to nine are about the preservation of constitutions, where Aristotle takes the lessons he's learned about what causes strife and faction and constitutional change and infers some strategies for preserving constitutions by way of preventing that kind of stasis. Now that's what uh, this lecture is going to focus on, but then Aristotle goes on in chapters 10 to 12 to discuss monarchies, their causes and destruction, the means by which they are preserved, and why tyrannies tend to be short-lived. Now, here's Aristotle's own description of the topics of Book 5. He says, the following issues remain by him to be discussed. The cause of stasis in states. How many and of what nature are the causes of faction, strife, civil war, and so forth? What modes of destruction apply to particular states, i.e. oligarchies or democracies? and out of what and into what constitutions mostly change. For example, democracies tend to become more like oligarchies. Finally, what are the modes of preservation in states generally or in a particular state, and by what means each state may be best preserved? Now, in the first chapter, Aristotle distinguishes three kinds of political change. The first, which I've already mentioned, is stasis. This is the most radical and important kind of change, change affecting the entire constitution, when the change is from an existing form into some other form of constitution. For example, from a democracy into an oligarchy, or from an oligarchy into a democracy, or from either of those into a aristocracy, and so on. The second kind of political change would be change that affects just the administration of the government when it changes hands from one group or one individual to another people. The third kind of change is change of degree. An oligarchy, for example, can become more or less oligarchical, and a democracy can be more or less democratic. And in like manner, the characteristics of the other forms of government may be more or less strictly maintained. Or the revolution or stasis may be directed against a portion of the constitution only, for example, the establishment or overthrow of a particular office. So of those three kinds of uh, change, Aristotle discusses each of them and how they relate to each other in this book. Now, the first topic, again, the most important, stasis and its main causes. Again, stasis means civil war as opposed to a foreign war, but also revolution, since Aristotle thinks of it as a cause of change of the entire constitution, but also faction, because the main cause of stasis is one group, whether that's a minority or a majority, pushing their own interests so far that it actually distorts and changes the kind of constitution. And Aristotle says that the main cause of this is having differing concepts of equality, the fact that people mean different things when they talk about equality. Quote, democracy, for example, arises out of the notion that those who are equal in any respect are equal in all respects, because men are equally free they claim to be absolutely equal. So that represents a kind of principle of democratic equality. We're all equal to each other. On the other hand, oligarchy, this is again a quote, 
is based on the notion that those who are unequal in one respect are in all respects unequal. Being unequal, that is, in property or wealth, they suppose themselves to be unequal absolutely. So people that have more wealth consider themselves to be unequal and to be superior to those who have less wealth, and thus they want more representation in offices, more political power, or even more distribution of wealth and property. But Democrats think that since they're equal, they ought to be equal in all things, while oligarchs, under the idea that they're unequal, claim too much. And that's one kind of inequality. So each of these forms of government, he says, have a kind of justice. So democracy, this kind of absolute equality, and oligarchy, a kind of equality based on equal amounts for equals, unequal amounts for unequals. And there is a sense in which both of those are a kind of justice. But tried to an absolute standard, it turns out both democratic and oligarchical concepts of equality will be faulty. Therefore, he says, both parties, whenever their share in government does not accord with their preconceived ideas, stir up a revolution or stasis. So Democrats, if they think that they're not getting their equal share of political power, wealth, or whatever, will stir up stasis in an oligarchy and attempt to change the constitution into something uh, democratic or less oligarchical. Oligarchs, on the other hand, considering themselves to be superior on the basis of their property or wealth, if they're not given more political power, say in a democracy, they will stir up stasis and attempt to uh, overthrow that constitutional structure, or at least to reduce its democratic aspects. And this is the main cause of this form of change and revolution, really. Now, to go into a little bit more detail about this idea that there's two kinds of equality. So Aristotle distinguishes between so-called numerical equality, which is simple sameness or equality in number or size. For example, 3 minus 2 equals 2 minus 1 because 1 equals 1. And he compares that with what he calls proportional equality, where you have not equality of the individual terms or numbers, but an equality of the ratios. So for example, uh, the ratio 4 to 2 is equal to the ratio 2 to 1. Even though the numbers aren't equal, the ratios are equal because 4 is double of 2, and 2 is double of 1, and double equals double. So Aristotle had actually introduced this distinction between two kinds of mathematical quality, equality earlier in his discussion of distributive justice in Politics Book 3, Chapters 9 and 12. Also, he discusses distributive justice and distinguishes these two kinds of equality in the second common book of the ethics, the third chapter of it. So that's EE 4.3 or Nicomachean Ethics 5.3. Now, the numerical concept of equality, the simpler one, corresponds to a democratic conception of equality. Each individual is worth exactly the same amount as every other. And so if you're going to distribute some good to them, such as land or offices, political power, whatever, each person would get an exactly equal amount. The proportional concept of equality, however, corresponds to an oligarchic conception of equality. Different people are worth different amounts based on their relative virtue or wealth or whatever. So if you were to distribute some good to them, again, something like land or political offices, those who are supposedly worth more would get a proportionally higher amount. So those twice as virtuous, say, or twice as wealthy, if we were just using wealth as the basis for political power, would get twice as much political power, political offices, land, or whatever, as those who are half as virtuous or wealthy as they are. Now, According to Aristotle, both kinds of equality should be employed in a constitution, and that would be conducive to the stability of the constitution. 
And because democracies uh, embrace a more widespread kind of equality, Aristotle says, that makes them relatively more stable. So first of all, he says that everywhere, again, is inequality is the cause of revolution or stasis, but an inequality in which there is no proportion. For instance, if you have a perpetual monarchy among people who are equals, um, always there'll be a desire for equality among those equals, and this will result in stasis or rebellion against a perpetual monarch. And so employing only one kind of equality, as the example shows, is bad and causes instability. That a state should be ordered simply and wholly according to either kind of equality is not a good thing. The proof is the fact that such forms of government never last. They are originally based on a mistake, and as they begin badly, they cannot fail to end badly. The inference is that both kinds of equality should be employed numerical in some cases, and proportionate equality in others. So your, your constitution, for example, might distribute offices according to proportionate equality and give offices to those who have more uh, virtue, more justice, more courage, etc., but might allow... Um, land to be distributed equally to everyone. And so you would then, uh, everyone would have some kind of share and some kind of uh, basic equality with other people, but then in, in order to satisfy those people who are or consider themselves to be superior, there would be this unequal distribution to them of political offices. And Aristotle thinks such schemes are very conducive to constitutional stability. Democracy, however, is inherently more stable and has less stasis. So he says that democracy appears to be safer and less liable to stasis than oligarchy. For an oligarchy, there is the double danger of the oligarchs falling out among themselves and also with the people. But in democracy, there's only the danger of a quarrel with the oligarchs. No dissension worth mentioning, he says, arise among the people themselves. Now that might be questionable, maybe there is a lot of dissension among people themselves and even hard to unite them. But he's talking here about the context of a kind of class struggle, economic and political interests of a very basic kind being vied over. Democracies uh, tend to be more stable because also they have a larger middle class. So he says, quote, we may remark further that a government which is composed of the middle class more nearly approximates to democracy than oligarchy and is the safest of the imperfect forms of government. Very important quotation, because although Aristotle acknowledges that democracy is an imperfect form of government, it's actually one of the corrupt or deranged forms, uh, he does think that it's the safest of those. If you're going to have a bad kind of constitution, it's much better to have a democracy than it is to have an oligarchy or a tyranny. And that's because, in part, democracies have a bigger middle class, and so there is less of this kind of class warfare between rich and poor, less demands by the rich to have unequal shares of office, less demands by the poor to be considered equal to them on the basis of their radical numerical concept of equality. And so since democracies have this large middle class, they end up having less stasis and more agreement in general. They are therefore the least bad of the imperfect forms of government. Now, in chapter two, Aristotle discusses the motives and basically the causes of stasis. Although he doesn't explicitly say so, the seven causes of stasis that he discusses in this chapter can be interpreted according to his distinction between four kinds of cause. There's the formal cause, the final cause, the efficient cause, and the material cause, and we can map them on to the various motives and causes of stasis that he discusses in this chapter. So he first describes the feeling, the actual emotional feeling of the revolutionaries and what 
those who are propagating factionalism, party politics, or revolution, and what kind of uh, motives and emotions they have, and what is the cognitive dimension especially of the emotions that they're feeling. So he describes a very complex set of desires consisting in the first place of the desire for equality and gain and honor, and this is sort of the formal cause of stasis. He says the universal and chief cause of this revolutionary feeling has already been mentioned. It's the desire for equality, when people think that they are equal to others who have more than themselves, or, again, the desire of inequality and superiority, when conceiving themselves to be superior, they think that they have not more but the same or less than their inferiors, pretensions which may and may not be just. Inferiors revolt in order that they may be equal, and equals so that they may be superior. Such is the state of mind which creates revolutions or stasis. Now, that's one aspect of the revolutionary feeling. Another is the desire for one's own gain and honor, including the want to divert punishment or dishonor away from oneself or away from one's friends. So not just what is the feeling that you're kind of irked by being treated unequally or treated equally, depending on who you are, but then a forward future looking desire to regain that honor or gain more of those possessions that you think weren't distributed equally or avoid punishment or dishonor from befalling yourself so that you throw yourself in with a party or faction or revolution in order to distract from it. That's the final cause in the sense of the aim or the purpose of the revolutionary uh, feeling. Now, the desire to prevent others from, maintain, from obtaining gain and honor, justly or unjustly, Aristotle treats as the efficient cause. So I notice that somebody's getting more profit, more money, more honor than I think they should. That inspires me to um, want to, desire, to, to get more for myself of honor, property, uh, whatever. And so the, it, it's what spurs this first movement that makes it like an efficient cause. And again, it's a desire to prevent others from obtaining gain and honor. But other things that could trigger it and cause it are insolence, fear of punishment, excessive predominance, contempt, and disproportionate growth in some part of the state. So there's actually seven different origins or efficient causes of stasis that Aristotle enumerates here. And he mentions that they may also be expanded to include election intrigues, carelessness, and neglect about trifles. So these are all efficient causes, or perhaps cooperating causes, that support this revolutionary feeling. And he goes on to discuss each one of them in detail in this and the next chapter. But finally, just to summarize how this all relates to his scheme of four causes, Aristotle mentions that dissimilarity of the elements, that is, of the population and territory, uh, is a contributing cause to stasis, that when elements are dissimilar, so they aren't equal in some way, uh, then that sets up the conditions and the material for a stasis to form when the desire for equality of gain and honor takes hold because somebody's been prodded to, by the desire to prevent others from obtaining it and by the desire for their own gain. Now, uh, a little bit more discussion of the motives for uh, stasis uh, in chapter three. Again, we've already said quite a bit about gain and honor. Uh, those are key factors in the revolutionary feeling, a desire for equality or inequality of gain and honor. Aristotle, in reiterating this in this chapter, says, now, in oligarchies, the masses make revolution under the idea that they are unjustly treated because, as I said before, they are equals and have not an equal share. 
And in democracies, the notables revolt because they're not equals and yet have only an equal share. So we can see how their, their uh, dispute exactly corresponds and correlates. Now, the uh, third uh, sort of um, instigator of this feeling of stasis could be insolence or greed. So he treats insolence or hubris and greed as a single cause, even though insolence without greed can also, in theory, be the cause of revolutions. But the main idea here is that the perception of oneself being dishonored or that of others receiving disproportionate honor will motivate citizens to factionalism and revolution in order to restore their own honor or remove that of others. And so this is a cause independent of the desire for honor mentioned above, because here the insolence of magistrates is the primary cause of the desire to increase one's own honor or decrease another's honor, whereas insolence or greed need not be the cause of the desire for honor. Another cause here, excessive predominance. When, sh when one person becomes so much more powerful than the rest of the political community, then the result is a kingship or tyranny, or what Aristotle calls a dynasty, a family kingship. Aristotle mentions that the Athenians use the instrument of ostracism in order to prevent this cause of stasis, meaning that they would uh, all vote uh, on a person to be removed, to be sent into exile because they'd become too uh, predominant over others and were considered a threat to political order. He says it's much better to provide from the beginning that there shouldn't be preeminent individuals instead of letting one of them come into existence and then having to resort to a remedy like ostracism. So we, would, we should remove people who are too wealthy or too politically power, powerful before they get more powerful, or we should prevent them from coming into existence in the beginning, have more of an equal society and equal opportunities so that uh, no one is able to become preeminent because it's much harder and much more of a crisis to deal with after they already have. Now, fear is another motive. Aristotle mentions fear of punishment, for example, or fear of an enemy's power as a cause of conspiracies, and he names historical examples like Rhodes. Contempt is also a cause. Uh, the contempt that one class has for another, for example, in oligarchies, the rich have contempt for the poor. In democracies, the poor have contempt for the rich, and this contempt causes neglect of the interests of the other class and thus motivates that class to conspiracy and factionalism. Now, Aristotle also discusses electioneering or campaigning as a cause of stasis. Now, he's overly brief here, but the example he gives suggests that election intrigue motivated a particular state to shift from elections to sortition. So something went wrong with their elections, so they decided we'll shift to assigning offices by lot. Now, since selection of offices by lot is considered a democratic process, while uh, elections are considered an oligarchic process, then this may have caused the constitution to change from an oligarchy into a democracy. You could imagine it going the other direction. If instead of uh, deciding by lots, we decided to start having elections, then elections, then, then our constitutional type might change from a more democratic to a more oligarchical one. Carelessness is also a motive for stasis. Aristotle's examples here have to do with disloyal people getting into high office and changing an oligarchic into a democratic constitution. Again, you can just as easily imagine the opposite, somebody getting elected or chosen by lot to a democratic office and then supporting oligarchic measures. Another cause, neglect. Aristotle's example here is where you'd set a certain property qualification for office, but it was pretty small, and then it diminishes over time, perhaps because of inflation, so that the qualification no longer excludes certain cases. It used to cost $100 uh, to um, be able to, you used to have to prove that you had $1,000 on hand in order to qualify for an office, but then as more and more people 
are able to show that they have $1,000, more and more people are able to qualify for the offices, and so it becomes more democratic and less oligarchic. So you shouldn't neglect that if you want to preserve an oligarchy. You should keep increasing the property qualification if, for example, the relative supply of money is going to continually increase. Aristotle also discusses racial differences as a motive for stasis. This corresponds to what he called dissimilarity of elements in the previous chapter. His examples are problems mostly caused by colonization, when colonists from two different cities try to set up their a city together, or an established colony tries to absorb a fresh body of colonists. Aristotle also discusses problems of adjustment of certain peoples to certain other peoples or places or even locations within a city. So he says that the occupants of the Piraeus, which is the harbor and shore of Athens, are somehow naturally more democratic than the people who are inland or who are in the citadel of the city. Finally, disproportionate increase in any part of the state, and this is a complex factor, so I will discuss it on its own slide. This is a major cause of stasis that Aristotle is interested in. He says that political revolutions spring up from any disproportionate increase in any part of the state. Now, what does he mean by part of the state? If we look back at the previous books in the politics, we'll see that several different things have been called parts of the state. First of all, households, which consists of master, slave, wife, and children. That's in book one and book four. He's also called social classes, which are stratified by uh, the level of birth, education, virtue, and so forth. Those were called parts of the state in books three and four, and also will be in book six. Also, he's described economic classes, i.e. rich and poor, as being parts of the state. That's in book four, also later on in book five, and he uses the same terminology in book six. Also, he's described as parts of the state's parts of the state, just jobs or functional groups. For example, warriors, farmers, politicians, etc. in book four, and he returns to this way of speaking also in book seven. He seems to hold that a disproportionate increase in any of these parts relative to the other parts may result in a political revolution. And here he makes an interesting analogy to zoology, especially interesting because he wrote a lot about zoology in his biological works, and this analogy doesn't seem to correspond well to his own methodological presuppositions in zoology. But here in the politics he says, as a body is made up of many members and every member ought to grow in proportion, that symmetry may be preserved, but loses its nature if the foot be four cubits long and the rest of the body two span. And should the abnormal increase be one of quality as well as quantity, may even take the form of another animal. Even so, a state has many parts, of which some may often grow imperceptibly. For example, the number of poor in democracies and in constitutional states. So, in the example he uses, he's talking about economic classes. Suppose that uh, there's a widening rich-poor gap, uh, small middle class, you get more and more numbers of people that are poor. Eventually, they become so big that they just, they're, uh, they, they, they overwhelm the power of the uh, rich, the few rich people that are left, and so there will be constitutional change. And it can happen even imperceptibly. Uh, now, what would the cause of the disproportionate increase itself be? The only examples Aristotle gives are of military defeats, actually, in which nobles end up getting slain, which results in a disproportionate increase in lower social classes which, again, would tend to a democratic overthrow of oligarchic constitutions. Uh, so the uh, wealthier people uh, in Greece who can afford to bear arms in these Greek city-states are the ones who would go off to war, unlike, say, in the United States, where the rich send the poor off to war. In this situation, the rich themselves are the ones that could be armed and uh, go to war. So then 
they risked being decimated uh, if things went very badly in a battle, in which case uh, there'd be none of them left and there would just be the poor uh, in the city and then you would uh, in fact have a kind of democratic uh, revolution. Now, small causes can have big effects on stasis, as Aristotle says, and he discusses several individual causes. First of all, issues with something as trivial as what's happening in individual marriages can go on to cause regime change, and Aristotle delights in giving us several historical examples of that. Also, a change in a single section could transform an entire constitution. So governments change into oligarchy or democracy or into a constitutional government because magistrates or some other section of the state increase in power or renown. And the examples here are very interesting. So Athens went from an oligarchy to a democracy and Argos from a democracy to an oligarchy by strengthening of nobles. Syracuse from a republic to a democracy when the people were seen as the cause of a victory against Athens. Chalcis went from a tyranny to a democracy after the nobles allied with the people, and so on. So these you know, small important sections of the government, if they take on a much different character, can uh, support a, a change in the entire constitution. Also, stasis itself tends to inspire further stasis, further revolutions and regime changes, either because people are really envious about the new order of things, or there is excessive predominance of those who have secured power towards others, or because there is envy of others towards them, or both. Also, decline of the middle class is a cause of stasis. Revolutions tend to break out when opposite parties, for example, the rich and the people, are equally balanced and there's little or no middle class, for if either par party were manifestly superior, the other would not risk an attack upon them. And for this reason, those who are eminent in virtue usually do not stir up insurrections, always being a minority. Finally, stasis may be affected either by force or by fraud or both, Force applied either before or after a revolution or fraud, which when discovered requires uh, either holding people in subjection against their will or persuading them to accept the regime. So each of those is a case of fairly small seeming things having a large constitutional effect. Okay, so having discussed the general causes of stasis in the previous chapters, in chapter 5 Aristotle starts discussing the causes of stasis in particular kinds of constitutions, beginning with democracies. And his discussion of democracies is really very straightforward and simple. He says the cause of stasis here is when demagogues rally people against the rich. Revolutions and democracies are generally caused by the intemperance of demagogues who either in their private capacity lay information against rich men until they compel them to combine, for a common danger unites even the bitterest enemies, or coming forward in public stir up the people against them. And Aristotle adduces several historical examples. Now Aristotle says formerly these demagogues within democracies were like generals, lately they've become uh, orators. So tyrannies were more common previously because with knowledge of military affairs, demagogues could wield more power, whereas orators only can lead on the public with their persuasion, not with their military dominance. Hence, safeguards are necessary against demagoguery in a democracy without, uh, for example, having property qualifications, a general election of magistrates could lead demagogues promising to put people above the law. And so Aristotle says a solution to this would be to divide the populace into tribes and have each elect magistrates separately instead of having a general election. And there's various other ways that you could safeguard against demagogues gaining too much power. 
Now, in chapter 6, Aristotle discusses the causes of stasis and oligarchies, and there are a lot more of them to discuss. Uh, for example, when oligarchs oppress the people, for then anybody is good enough to be their champion, especially if he be himself a member of the oligarchy. This, Aristotle says, generally results in a tyranny, but he gives other historical examples of oligarchies becoming republics and even democracies. Now, they, stasis also occurs within oligarchies when there's personal rivalry of the oligarchs, and so they fall out with one another, or one or more of them may try to play the demagogue with the people. Or when an oligarchy is excessively narrowed, this may cause greater calls for equality toward a polity or a democracy. So even if you had a, uh, an oligarchy with relatively more oligarchs, if you narrowed and narrowed that down, for example, with a greater and greater property qualification, then you'd be alienating more and more people, and this would contribute to stasis. Also, when oligarchs waste their public fortunes, on extravagant living, their power collapses. When some party within an oligarch steals from the treasury, this can cause internal dissension and cause their power to collapse. When within an oligarchy, an even smaller oligarchy is created. For example, within an oligarchy, if you set up an elite senate, which excludes other oligarchs, would result in a more extreme oligarchy, but could also motivate others to strife and factionalism. Uh, when in war, if an oligarchy depends on mercenaries, these mercenaries may be loyal to a faction or to an individual and thus help set up a tyranny. Also, when in peace, if there's mutual distrust and the two parties hand over defense to the military, the military may end up as master of both of them, sort of military coup. Also, when there are quarrels over marriages or lawsuits, an oligarchic regime may be destroyed, as we mentioned above in discussing the causes of stasis and how small causes can have big effects. Finally, when a property qualification remains unchanged but wealth in the city increases, then, as we've already noted, many more people become eligible for office and they might transform an oligarchy into a polity or even a democracy. In chapter 7, Aristotle discusses the causes of stasis in aristocracies. One is when a few only share in the honors of a state. Um, that tends to motivate people to stasis, um, a cause which we've already discussed in connection with oligarchies. But in aristocracy, Aristotle admits, is a kind of oligarchy. And like an oligarchy is the government of just a few people. And since all so-called aristocratic governments incline towards oligarchy, the notables are apt to be grasping. That is, um, there will always be some notable people who are left out of the honors of the state. Now, when the mass of people are of a very high-spirited kind and have a notion that they're as good as their rulers, that is an obvious cause of stasis in aristocracies. When great men who are at least of equal merit or dishonored by those in higher office, when an individual who is great and might become even greater wants to rule alone, or when trifling gets out of hand. In aristocracies above all, there are gradual and imperceptible uh, causes here. Citizens begin by giving up some part of the constitution, and so with greater ease, the government changes into something else which is a little more important until they've undermined the whole fabric of the state. So small changes that accumulate in order to transform the entire constitution. Also, when there's a significant or foreign influence is a cause of stasis in aristocracies. So when there is some government close at hand who has an opposite interest, but even though it's at a distance, it's powerful, this was exemplified in the old times of the Athenians and the Spartans. The Athenians everywhere would put down oligarchies, and the Spartans would put down everywhere democracies. That is, they would encourage stasis or faction in the opposite direction. Now, another 
cause of stasis in aristocracies are structural problems with the constitutions. These are actual problems with the theory of the way it's set up. And this has to do with inadequate mixing of democratic and oligarchic elements. An aristocracy somehow has to represent the interests of both the rich and the poor, otherwise it wouldn't be a legitimate form of government, but would be either an oligarchy or a democracy. But constitutional governments and aristocracies are commonly overthrown owing to some deviation from justice in the constitution itself. The cause of the downfall is, in the former, the ill mingling of the two elements, democracy and oligarchy, in the latter of the three elements, democracy, oligarchy, and virtue but especially of democracy and oligarchy, for to combine these is the endeavor of constitutional governments, and most of the so-called aristocracies have a like aim, but differ from polities or constitutional governments in the mode of combination. Hence, some of them are more and some less permanent. Those which incline more to oligarchy are called aristocracies, and those which incline to democracy, constitutional governments. And therefore the latter are the safer of the two, for the greater the number, the greater the strength, and when men are equal, they are contented. So there's a lot going on in that passage, but I think one interesting thing about it is that what we call aristocracies may very well be understood to essentially be either oligarchies or constitutional uh, governments, some kind of mixed constitutional arrangement. When aristocracies are in fact more like oligarchies, you know, whenever you ask an oligarch, he considers himself an aristocrat, not an oligarch. So some oligarchies uh, disguise themselves as aristocracies, but suppose you had a real aristocracy, but it just inclined towards an oligarchy because the rich were relatively powerful well, then you would be exposed to all of the causes of stasis that affect oligarchies and thus less stable than a democracy. Democracies, um, there's, a, there's this, this other kind of constitution, generically called constitutional government or polity or republics or whatever. They are understood by Aristotle to be a kind of combination of democracies and oligarchies, but when an aristocracy more resembles a constitutional government, then it has more of an admixture of a democratic element. And if you remember what we said at the very beginning, that a, a, a proper mixture of democratic and oligarchic uh, instruments in the constitution are is, is a major cause of preservation and stability of a constitution, because then the interests are balanced and they don't become disproportionate. But that being said, all other things being equal, democracies are relatively more stable than oligarchies. The main thing you have to worry about is demagogues coming up within them, but you don't have the exposure to all the kinds of problems and instability that you do in an oligarchy. Now, Aristotle notes that although aristocracies are typically transformed into oligarchies, they may also become transformed into a democracy. Similarly, although constitutional governments are typically transformed into democracies, they may also become oligarchies. And in general, the only stable principle of government is equality owing to proportion and for every man to enjoy his own. So Aristotle actually prefers the proportionate concept of equality, which was identified with oligarchical uh, concept of equality early on, but he prefers democracy as the more stable form of government in general. So these considerations of the cause of stasis, both general and for specific constitutional types, then is translated in the next two chapters into a theory of means of preserving constitutions. And he begins with the idea of promoting obedience to law. Here the general principle is that we should study the causes of stasis or revolutions, and then opposing those causes will preserve the constitution, and of all the ways of doing that, obedience to the law is key. And employing deception and secrecy and so forth, Aristotle thinks is a very limited 
value in preserving constitutions. In all well-tempered or well-balanced governments, there is nothing which should be more jealously maintained than the spirit of obedience to law, more especially, he says, in small matters, for transgression creeps in unperceived and at last ruins the state, just as the constant recurrence of small expenses in time eats up a fortune. The expense does not take place all at once and therefore is not observed. The mind is deceived, as in the fallacy which says, if each part is a little, then the whole must be little. In the first place, then, one should guard against the beginning of change, and in the second place, they should not rely on the political devices of which I've already spoken, invented only to deceive people, for they are proved by experience to be useless. So, experience, empirical research has showed Aristotle that you cannot maintain stability by deceiving people, and that what is necessary is to prevent change by eliminating or reducing the motive to stasis, which has to do with equalities and not proportionately balancing the interests of people. So, fostering a spirit of equality and respect among the people will be preservative of all kinds of constitutions, not just democracies. Another mechanism he mentions is term limits. So, if the ruling class is numerous enough, these are very useful. They tend to preclude demagogues, prevent oligarchies and aristocracies from falling into the hands of individuals or families. Long tenure of office tends to entrench individuals and enhance individual power at the expense of the state. Now, the second um, general set of means of preserving constitutions, he discusses various kinds of safeguards. First, you could invent terrors. Quoting, Constitutions are preserved when their destroyers are at a distance and sometimes also because they are near, for the fear of them makes the government keep in hand the constitution. Wherefore, the ruler who has a care of the constitution should invent terrors and bring distant dangers near, in order that the citizens may be on their guard and, like sentinels in a night watch, never relax their attention. End of quote. Now, it might seem shocking to have Aristotle uh, advocating the use of terrorism in order to preserve a constitution, but this is more likely just an observation that they end up getting per preserved when such terrors have been invented. In his study of constitutions, this has been revealed, that this is one of the techniques that people take. Now, as we saw on the last slide, Aristotle thinks that that kind of deception is not in the long run effective and will not contribute to the stability of the state, but he mentions it as a technique that has been employed and may have some limited usefulness. Additionally, limiting contention and dissension among the ruling class through statesmanship is a cause of stability. Adjusting property qualifications in response to inflation or deflation to make sure you preserve the same kind of people coming into office, and also safeguarding against any part of the state growing disproportionate in power. The proper remedy, he says, for this evil is always to give the management of affairs and offices of the state to opposite elements. Such opposites include the virtuous and the many, or the rich and the poor. Give them both. Give each set some kind of role in the state. Another way, he says, is to combine the rich and poor into one body or increase the middle class. If there's enough of a middle class, an end will be put to the revolutions which arise from the motive of inequality, the main cause of stasis. The third general set of things that are discussed as means of preserving constitutions, Aristotle says, Above all, a state should be so administered and so regulated by law that its magistrates cannot possibly make money, so you need to avoid corruption. In oligarchies, this is a special problem. The majority don't really mind being kept out of power. What they really mind is the idea that those who are in power are enriching themselves and not acting in the common interest. So, if you could arrange it so that an office brought absolutely no profit, then and only then would a democracy and aristocracy, he says, be combined. 
for both notables and people might have their wishes gratified. All would be able to hold office, which is the aim of democracy, and the notables would be magistrates, which is the aim of aristocracy. And this result may be accomplished when there is no possibility of making money out of the offices, for the poor will not want to have them when there is nothing to be gained from them, they'd rather be attending to their own concerns, and the rich, who do not want to make money from the public treasury, will be able to take them. And so the poor will keep to their work and grow rich, and the notables will not be governed by the lower class. So, interesting idea that you could fuse democracy and aristocracy there if you could eliminate profit motive to hold office. Now, various measures, he says, should be enacted to ensure public confidence that offices are not being profited from. So, for example, when there's transfers of revenue, this should be done at public assemblies, keep duplicates of accounts and make those available to all tribes, make sure that honors are only given to honest magistrates, and so forth. Also, the rich should not be allowed to undertake, even if they're willing to, expensive but useless public services like financing of choruses and torch races and things like this, because that tends to, uh, the people appreciate that, but then they tend to overlook corrupt activities uh, that those people engage in. Now, those who have less share of government, so the poor in oligarchies, the rich in democracies, should nevertheless be given equal or preferential access to some high offices, Aristotle thinks, and then you can kind of co-opt the poor by giving them certain offices, or co-opt uh, the rich if you're in a democracy by putting them in charge of some things. So again, Aristotle is always looking to balance out and eliminate that motive, that ever annoying sense of either equality or inequality. So some further means that he discusses of preserving constitutions, qualifications for office, for example, loyalty, skill, and uh, virtue. These, these three actually are the main forms of setting up a qualification for office. It's what you're always looking for. It's what we're trying to make sure that people have that hold office. We also want a mean and proportional or moderate condition in which things aren't pushed to extremes of democracy or oligarchy by factions or parties pursuing their own interests instead of common interests. And also he says, rhetorical concession should be made to the other party, as opposed to, for example, taking oaths to undermine the other party, as some oligarchs uh, take nowadays, he says. Also, the adaptation of the educational system to the Constitution, something that turns out to be crucially important, and he devotes the last books of the politics to discussing. But educating people into the values of the Constitution and inculcating those in them from an early age and continuously through, through the rest of their lives is an important means of preserving the Constitution. Now, a bit more on this idea of qualifications for high offices. There are three of them, as I said. First, loyalty to the established Constitution. Second, skill or administrative capacity. And third, virtue and justice of the kind proper to each form of government. Since what is just is not the same of all governments, the quality of justice differs, again, in oligarchies, proportional equality, in democracies, numeric or arithmetic equality. So you want a person who has a concept of virtue or justice uh, that's proportionate if you're in an oligarchy and which is numerical if you're in a democracy. But what happens when not all of these candidates are in the same candidate? So they um, lack loyalty to the established constitution, or they have that, but they lack administrative capacity and skill, or they have skill and loyalty, but they have a different concept of equality. Assume that in a set of candidates there will be varying degrees of each of these qualifications. How then is the selection among them to be made? So suppose, for example, you have a, a good military general, but he's a bad man and not a friend to the Constitution. Another man is um, 
loyal and just, but sort of lacks the administrative skill to effectively administrate the office. Aristotle says the solution is to distinguish cases where the skill is rare, and in those cases choose on the basis of skill, but where the skill is commonly held, then choose on the basis of virtue. So when you're choosing a military general, think about the person who has military skill rather than his virtue. For few people have military skill, but many have virtue. But in an office of trust or stewardship, on the other hand, the opposite should be observed. For more virtue than ordinary is required the holder of such an office, but the knowledge necessary is of a sort which all people possess. So if somebody has to be in charge of accounts and making sure that um, nobody's wrongly taking money out of the treasury or something, anyone can do that because anybody can add and subtract. Um, but you need to make sure that you have a virtuous person, somebody who's honest, just, etc. So virtue, not just loyalty and skill, are necessary for good statesmanship is the conclusion of that argument, that you really need virtue and justice, and specifically justice of the appropriate kind for the kind of government that you're trying to preserve. Now, another set of general means of preserving constitutions, proportionality and the moderate state. An oligarchy or democracy, although a departure from the most perfect form, may yet be a good enough government. But if anyone attempts to push the principles of either to an extreme, an extreme oligarchy or an extreme democracy, he will begin by spoiling the government and end by having none at all. Wherefore, the legislator and the statesman ought to know what democratic measures save and what destroy a democracy, and what oligarchic measures save or destroy an oligarchy. Neither the one nor the other can exist or continue to exist unless, Aristotle says, both rich and poor are included in it. So in any case, stability of any or either of these forms of government requires that rich and poor interests somehow be balanced. For example, if equality of property is introduced, the state must of necessity take another form, for when laws carried to excess, one or the other element in a state is ruined, the constitution is ruined. So Aristotle represents this as an example of an extreme measure. Imagine you have a democracy so extreme that they want to equalize the amount of property or land that everybody has. Well, then this, this would so fundamentally transform society that it would create essentially a different form of constitution. And again, Aristotle makes an interesting analogy to a biological organism. Last time he was describing if a foot was too large, this time it's a nose. A nose which varies from the ideal of straightness to a hook or snub may still be of good shape and agreeable to the eye, but if the excess be very great, all symmetry is lost and the nose at last ceases to be a nose at all on account of some excess in one direction or defect in the other. And this is true of every other part of the human body. The same law of proportion equally holds in states. Now the next set of general means for preserving constitution is adaptation of the educational system to the constitution. And of all the things that Aristotle has mentioned, he says, this is the one which most contributes to the permanence of constitutions. And yet, in his own day, he says, and perhaps in our own day, this is the principle that is almost universally neglected. And again, Book 8 is entirely devoted to this issue. Aristotle says that the best laws, though sanctioned by every citizen of the state, will be of no avail unless the young are trained by habit and education in the spirit of the Constitution. If the laws are democratic, democratically or oligarchically, if the laws are oligarchical. For there, must, there may be want of self-discipline in states as well as in individuals. So it doesn't matter if currently everybody is on board with what the state wants and has the proper kind of equality. We have to continually be changing, training the young and inculcating these values in them or very soon the constitutional type will change. 
But, Aristotle says, to have been educated in the spirit of the Constitution is not to perform the actions in which oligarchs or democrats delight, but those by which the existence of an oligarchy or a democracy is made possible. So not by being a popular demagogue in the case of a democrat or an oppressive oligarch in the case of oligarchy, but rather the true oligarch is the person who is even willing to enact democratic measures to the extent necessary to preserve their oligarchy. Or the true democrat is the democrat who's willing to introduce those oligarchic reforms necessary in order to preserve the stability of their democracy. Now the final set, um, final piece of discussion about preserving constitutions, Aristotle makes a special note on the preservation of democratic freedom, and it's a continuation of the point uh, just made. Democratic freedom doesn't just mean doing whatever anybody pleases, like some very superficial or naive notion of freedom that some people associate with democracy, but rather true democratic freedom means submission to majority rule. But in democracies of the more extreme tar type, there has arisen a false idea of freedom which is contradictory to the true interest of the state. For two principles are characteristic of democracy. Number one, the government of the majority. Okay, and this is why submission to majority rule is the crucial element of democratic freedom. And second, freedom itself, understood as the ability to do with what one pleases or live how one wants. Now, Aristotle says that men think that what is just is equal and that equality is the supremacy of popular will and that freedom means the doing what a man likes. In such democracies, everyone lives as he pleases or in the words of Euripides, according to his fancy. So this is a characterization of an extreme concept of democracy, actually bordering on, a, bordering on a kind of anarchical state in which everyone lives exactly as he pleases and doesn't do much to coordinate his activities with other people. Aristotle says all of this is wrong. Men should not think that it's slavery to live according to the rule of the Constitution, for it is their salvation. So this is what a democracy truly consists in, is orderly submission to the majority's rule, not going against what the majority rules because you want to live however you want to live, but allowing your freedom to be defined and circumscribed exactly by what the majority describes. That is the true democratic way. Now, Aristotle mentions this here because it instantiates the point about the importance of adapting education to the Constitution. In order to preserve a democratic constitution, it's necessary that citizens be educated into understanding democratic values and rule and the importance of submitting themselves to majority rule. So to summarize the general means of preserving constitutions, which Aristotle has deduced from his analysis of the means of destroying constitutions and then sort of reverse engineered these techniques, the first idea is promoting obedience to the law and the Constitution. Second, safeguarding against contention, dissension, and disproportionate growth of one part of the state or one class of the state. Third, enacting measures to avoid corruption, so transparency in the use of state funds and so forth. Fourth, requiring qualifications for office, loyalty to the Constitution, skill and virtue in order for people to be candidates to hold office. Fifth, moderating the Constitution to ensure proportionality between the parts of the state, the rich and the poor, the oligarchic and democratic elements, and thus avoiding the extreme policies advocated by parties and factions in their own interest. And finally, adapting public education to the specific form of the Constitution. All of those will be ways of preserving each kind of constitution and, in general, any kind of constitution. Thank you.